Greetings and welcome again to our friends out around the world to our amazing Discovery Studio for another health program today. I am anxious to tell you our message today. I believe it will have great benefits for your health. Today's topic is going to be the best fats for our health. We're all curious about fats. We hear a lot of things about it, and I hope I bring something new to you that is helpful. Before we get started, let's bow for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, whatever we do and wherever we go, we thank you that you are with us. And today, as we want to learn more about good health, we want to have sound principles that are founded from your word, the Bible. So would you be here with us? Help us to learn in simple ways things that can change our health and make us happy and joyful in you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, let's open our Bible and have a good principle right at the beginning from the Bible. If we open up to Psalms and look at chapter 103, there's um, a few verses all the way through um, verse 1 through 5, but I want to look at verse 2 and verse 5. It says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. And forget not all of his benefits, who satisfi satisfies thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. Is that something you would want? Would you like to have your mouth satisfied with good things, so that your youth is your um, youth is renewed like the eagles. Well, that's an enticing promise for me. And as we look at it, when we think, oh, God's going to give us good things for our mouth, does that mean that they always taste good? Or just because something tastes good, it's going to be good for our health? The principle that God says is in the guidelines that what is good that he will put in our mouth is something that will renew our youth like the eagles. So it has to be something that helps promote our, our vitality and our youth instead of aging us and degenerating us. What we're going to look at today are fats. And so I want to ask you the question, are fats a good thing? Are th would this be something that God um, is going to satisfy our mouths with? Well, the, the answer is an, a resounding yes. Everybody needs fats. It just depends on what kind of fats you get it and the form that you get it in. But you can definitely say the fats are one of the building blocks that our body needs. In fact, every cell membrane is made up of fats. Fats are also important for transport and oxidation of cholesterol. Thus, because these fats are helpful with getting rid of cholesterol, it can help lower the plasma cholesterol level. Fats are also important as precursors for incredible hormones in, this, in the body that are responsible for our immune system, for maintaining a proper blood pressure. Um, these types of hormones are called eicosanoids, and there's three main ones, the prostaglandins, the leukotrienes, and throm the thromboxanes. So these are some of the top benefits of the use of fats in our body. But science has found today that vegetable fats are the better kind of fats for our health. As we look at a progression through the last 50 years, Back in the mid-1960s, the experts were recommending that we replace butter with margarine. So margarine was just coming out on the market, and the researchers were saying, okay, this is better for your health because it's not an animal product, so let's start using margarine instead of butter. And instead of using lard, which is also an animal product, let's switch it and use something that's healthier, that comes from vegetables like corn or safflower oil, so that it will protect our hearts. Well, a decade later, in the 1970s, they studied a little bit more, and guess what they found? 
The researchers were then saying, uh-oh, guess what? Margarine actually raises the cholesterol more than butter. Oh dear, should we go back to butter? Well, not that quick. We've got to look at something different. But what they thought in the 60s was not right. Margarine was not better than butter for cholesterol. And what they found that um, on vegetable oil instead of lard, it did improve the cholesterol um, levels better than lard, but it increased the risk of cancer and obesity. They were finding that those vegetable oils were making people fat. So that's a problem. Well, then we moved up into the 1990s, and by the 1990s, the experts are recommending liberal amounts of olive oil. They're looking at the Mediterranean diet, and they say, oh, it's the olive oil that are making these people so healthy. So use as much olive oil as you want. That's a monounsaturated fat, and that's got to be better. It's not hydrogenate, um, totally hydrogenated. It's not polysaturated. It's the best. That's what we want you to use. And then they were also recommending some of the polyunsaturated omega-3 fats, such as you what you find in fish and in flaxseed oils. Well, we move up into the 2000s, and what the experts are um, recommending that we take in liberal amounts in the 2000s is coconut oil. And that's a saturated fat. So do you see how we move through each different decade? The experts keep telling us something different. Well, there are benefits to some of these fats that they're recommending. But there are really more serious implications than the benefits that we're finding from them. So we're going to look at them. But before we look at the, the complications and the detrimental effects of fats, I want to just briefly look at what a fat is composed of. So fats are simply a chain of carbons. They have oxygen and hydrogen on them, but they differ because there's dozens of different types of fat, and they all have carbon as a, as a main skeleton, a, a, a backbone. But they differ in the number of those carbons, they differ in the length, of their structure and in the position of double bonds throughout the carbon um, structure. So if you look up on our slide, you'll see on the left-hand side here on the top, this is a structure for saturated fat, and on the bottom we have unsaturated fat. And on the totally saturated fat, what you'll see is there is only a single line between each carbon. That represents a single bond. So it's what joins the carbons together. So it's a single bond. And if you look down at the unsaturated fat, there are a number of carbons that have a double bond. So if you'll take a closer look, you'll see the difference. Where there's a double bond between the carbons, there's not a hydrogen coming out on the arms. So the hydrogen is taken off, and that bond then goes to the carbon. That makes it a double bond. And that changes the function and um, the usability of that fat. Now, um, we're not going to go a lot into the differences and the different structures of saturated all the way down to monounsaturated and polysaturated. It has to do with the number of, of the bonds that you have. But the key thing that I want you to know is that the structure changes and the function changes as we change the bonds. Well, let's go right into the healthy fats. Our body can make every fat that our system needs, hormones, cholesterol, that type of thing, they're using fats, except there are two fats that it needs that it cannot generate by putting different um, substances together in the body. And these two fats are called essential fatty acids, or we'll call them EFAs for short. The two types are gamma-linolenic um, acid, 
that's an omega-6, which means the first double bond is the sixth carbon from the end. And then there's alpha-lenolenic acid, which is an omega-3. The first carbon bond, double bond is the third one from the end. Um, the interesting thing is, is that these essential fatty acids, they're essential because our body can't make them. We have to get them from our food source. The only source of these fats are from plants. The only primary source. Animals can eat them in the plants, and then it, if you eat the animal, you can get the benefits of the um, fatty acids, the essential fatty acids from the animals. But animals cannot produce the omega-3 and the omega-6 fatty acids. They have to get it from plants, just like we do. So I want to give you a list here. If you look up at our slide, we have five different types of essential fatty acids. The first one on our list is lenoleic acid. That's the name for an omega-6. And as I mentioned, it's from plants. It's the most common omega-6 omega fat that people eat. Now, there's different types of the lenoleic. So you just have the lenoleic acid. And then you have gamma leno lenoleic acid. This, again, is an omega-6, and it's made from plants. And its primary use is not for food consumption. They use it more for medicinal reasons. The next one is alpha lenoleic, lenolenic, these uh, tongue twisters. You've got to get the ends in there. This fatty acid is an omega-3, and it's the most consumed um, omega-3 fatty acid. And again, this one is only from plants. Now, the last two that are not highlighted, these come from animals. So we have the eicosapentaenoic acid, or EPA. This comes from animals, including fish. It is an omega-3 fatty acid. And how it, the animals get it is only by eating the plants. So if a fish is eating plankton and the, the vegetation that grows in the ocean, it contains this um, omega-3 fatty acids in the fish stores it in its body, and then when you eat the fish, you get a concentration of that food. And the last one is a docosahexanoic acid, or DHA, that also comes from animals, and it's an omega-3 fatty acid, from animals consuming plants that have the omega-3. Let me show you a chart. Um, you have to take a close-up look at this. The omega-6 is the far left-hand column. Some of the common sources of omega-6 fatty acids are safflower oil, sunflower oil, hemp, soybeans, walnuts, pumpkin, sesame seed, and flax. The next three columns are your source of omega-3s. So the second column over is your alpha-lenolenic um, fatty acid. And here you've got your flax, your hemp, canola, soybean, and walnuts also contain the omega-3. And our green leafy vegetables. I, I bet you didn't realize that green leafy vegetables even have a good source of fats in them. So it's very hard to have a deficit of these essential fatty acids because even foods that we don't think to contain any fat have a good source of them. And the last two columns are the, um, or, well, actually the third one is from plants, borage, black currant seed, and primrose, but the acosapentaenoic um, fatty acid is found in cold water marine fish. So there's a wide variety of sources where you can get your essential fatty acids, the omega-6 and omega-3. So the question is, how much of these fats do we need? Well, the, it's not how much do we want, because fats are delicious, and especially when we combine them with sugar. If you think about it, most sugar has, um, is associated with fats. Things that we eat that are sugary tend to be fatty as well. But actually, is the amount that we need is very limited. 
um, scientists have said that it's about 1 to 2 percent of our dietary energy. So if you take in a 2,000 calorie um, diet a day, if you look at how much we need, it's really a small amount. It's only 1 to 2 percent of our dietary energy. The essential fatty acid deficiency is essentially unknown because there's so much fat in every source of food. So even people that are on a very sparse diet will not have an essential fatty acid problem. Now, some people say, well, if you consume large amounts of bad fats, that it will lower your amounts of good fats. That's relatively true, but if you're just looking at overall finding enough of the essential fatty acids, it's very difficult to find. Let's look at some of the benefits that are out there for the essential fatty acids. Now, one of the things that they say for the essential fatty acids is that it has a great benefit on platelets. Studies have been done that they say tend to decrease the aggregation of platelets or slowing down blood coagulation. This is a problem with um, heart attacks. Um, when your blood gets clots in it, you will get a heart attack or even a stroke. So the benefit of essential fatty acids is that it has the potential to thin the blood. Some people even recommend taking capsules of flaxseed oil or fish oil to reduce the risk of heart disease. Another benefit that is claimed for the essential fatty acids is that it suppresses the immune system because it reduces inflammation. So scientists and researchers have been trying it out on things like autoimmune diseases, arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis, eczema, psoriasis. They've even tried it for migraines and in some places for Alzheimer's disease. However, in all these studies that they are looking at this, they have found that the benefits are variable and sometimes unreliable. So this is a questionable issue of whether these essential fatty acids really benefit the immune system and dampening autoimmune diseases. What about weight loss? There's a lot of claims out there that essential fatty acids will promote a weight loss, that it will help you to be lean, that it increases your metabolic um, machinery, and that it will enhance your athletic performance and put you into a better um, mood and brain function. This was from an advertisement that was um, selling essential fatty acids, the flaxseed oil and the fish oil. Well, there's a different side to the coin. Benefits exist, but they're not as great as the detrimental effects. But what we're looking at is not really essential fatty acids in, in general. What we're looking at is the way that essential fatty acids are delivered to our food supply. The detrimental effects have been found when the fatty acids are delivered in refined oil, not in the whole plant food. So if you are eating the whole plant, like whole flax seeds, walnuts, that's different than oil. So let's look into that a little bit deeper because this truly is where the health problems come in. So what is a refined essential fatty oil, or essential fatty acid, excuse me? Well, it's basically what we call oil or sometimes it's called grease if it's in a more solid form. And oils are simply fats that have been isolated out of the plant, such as what we do with corn, and we have the corn cob, and we extract the oil out through a process that removes all the fiber, all the nutrients, all of the enzymes. There's no nutrition left except for that fat. So, I would say that these oils 
cannot really even be considered food any longer because the nutrition has been removed. They would go more in the category of a supplement. In concentrated form, fatty acids have been found to have some benefit, but mostly their side effects are great and can be very harmful. I want to show you that even in the Bible, there's a principle that we should eat food in the whole form. So I would say whole food, whole. And I would say whole plant food, whole. If you look in the Bible in Matthew 19, 6, this is a, in context, what was going on is um, a group of men came to Jesus and they were asking him about divorce. And they were asking why um, Moses gave a, a permission for a decree of divorcement to be allowed. Um, and as Jesus was talking to them, he came to this principle and he says, what God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. So we always think about this in terms of marriage. But I believe that we can apply this principle to what God has made in general. When he puts a plant together, he wants you to consume it in its whole form. And I want to show you why I believe this, because as we look at the detrimental effects on health from oil, we will see that the problems always come in when the food is removed from its original source. So let's, let's just look at some of the claims. Let's look at first the claim that it was beneficial for weight um, loss. What they have really found in multiple studies, we've got one up here that it was a study of over 100 women. And in a 12-week double-blind study, they evaluated the use of evening primrose on these women. What they saw was that there was no significant difference in weight loss achieved by those taking the primrose oil compared to those who took a placebo. So there was really no effect at all on weight loss in that study. Another study was done on 54 obese women that lived in the Mediterranean area. They looked at their overall lifestyle and they looked at what type of diet they were eating and they found that their carbohydrates were very low. It was only 34% of their dietary intake. But their fats were very high. It was 43% of their overall calories. And the majority of that fat was from olive oil. The conclusion as they looked at their lifestyle and the food that they were consuming was that the olive oil really did not have a benefit on helping them to lose weight. In fact, it was the opposite. The conclusion was, if you have a diet that's high in oil and low in fruits and vegetables, it's going to make you fat. So that kind of did away with these ideas that the essential fatty acids are ben beneficial for weight loss. Now, keep in mind what I'm talking about, what they are studying are the refined oils. You can get your essential fatty um, acids in the whole form and you're going to have different results. Now, what about heart protection? Is olive oil beneficial to protect the heart? Well, there's been a number of studies done. Let's look at this one study that was actually done on humans. And it's always nice to have one of these. Most of our science is done on animals. And there's some correlation, but we can never say definitively that it would act just the same in, in humans. But this study was done on humans. David Blankenhorn um, did the study, and what he did was compare the effects of different types of fat on the growth of atherosclerotic lesions inside the coronary arteries with angiograms taken one year apart. So he had his subjects, he took an angiogram, and then he gave them three different types of fats. And a year later, he took another angiogram. The three fats that he studied was saturated animal fat. And just so you know, all animal fat is saturated. So 
animal fat, and monounsaturated fat, which is olive oil, and then he used a polyunsaturated fat, an essential fatty acid. Here's what he found. He found significant increase in atherosclerotic lesions with all three types of the fats that he examined. If you look at the picture on the right-hand side, if you see where the arrow is, you, the, that dark line going down that looks like a path, that's the blood vessel, coronary artery. And you see where you, it almost disappears? That's because of an atheros, atherosclerotic um, patch that has been occluding the blood vessel. This person is just about ready for a heart attack. What they found is that the growths of the lesions continued even when they were taking the polyunsaturated omega-6 in a vegetable form and olive oil. Both of those continued to promote these lesions to form until it went to full um, atherosclerosis. They took the group that was eating saturated fats and the lesions were progressing as well. And they switched them out and gave them the olive oil, the unsaturated, mono, monounsaturated fat, and the lesions did not stop. What they found was the only thing that stopped the progression of these lesions that were going on in the coronary vessels was to stop all free fat completely. So on, on my slide, I just want, I want to make a little correction. It says decreasing all fat intake stopped the growth. That was the, all the fats that they were um, studying, um, the free oils and the animal fat. Well, let's look at another study. This is with the same type of problem, the atherosclerotic um, plaque. And our picture here on the right-hand side is a cross-section of a blood vessel. So on the lower left corner, that's the outer lining of the blood vessel. And as you move in, the very center, what you see are blood cells that are flowing through the vessel. And so that inner lining um, is broken open, and the yellow that you see is the fat deposits. That's what's building up in the blood vessels that will eventually occlude the artery and cause a heart attack. So in this study that was recorded in The Lancet, they were looking at polyunsaturated fats, both the omega-3 and the omega-6 types, and they found that they are incorporated right into the blood vessel in these types of lesions. And the um, damage was promoted and and the progression continued as long as they were taking in these free fats. Well, part of the problem of why these fats, when they're in the form of a free oil, is because fats are very easily oxidized. What that means is that they, um, they become damaging. It's what we call free radicals, and instead of being healthy, they break down cells, they deteriorate cells, and that, that's what is doing the damage to our blood vessels. Most research indicates that the omega-6, here we see it as W6, that stands for the omega-6 of essential fatty acids, are much more damaging to the blood vessels than our omega-3 blood um, omega-3 types of essential fatty acids. Now there was another study done on, these were on African green monkeys. And they had been feeding them saturated fats and they looked at their blood vessels. And then they took and they replaced that um, saturated fat with olive oil. They found that olive oil did not give any protection from the atherosclerosis that was being formed. So this was another study that um, validated other studies that were going on. We can see many studies that are saying olive oil is not the healthiest. 
it might be better than our saturated fats and our margarines and some of the more damaging like your omega-6, but it does not stop the lesions being formed in our blood vessels. And I just want to interject the idea that heart disease is the number one cause of mortality in the United States. And worldwide, it is a very high cause of mortality. So this is very important. And looking at the amount of consumption of oil that we have, I believe we need to pay attention to this because it's one of the, the causes that we're having heart disease. Well, let's look at oil and blood clotting. There was a study done that looked at five different types of fats. These fats were canola oil, olive oil, sunflower oil, palm oil, and they also then looked at butter. The results from all five were the same. It didn't matter what the fat was. What they found was considerable increases in plasma triglycerides and plasma levels of blood coagulation factors. So these blood coagulation factors, as they increase, they're going to form more clots. So this is a very alarming finding. They found that blood clots or thrombrosis um, is in, in the heart artery were increasing from this type of fat. The increase of factor seven was significant. This factor is one of the most important clotting factors that predict whether a person is going to have a heart attack. And so they found that all of these fats that were used, including the olive oil that was in there, and canola oil, because that's up there with one of the top oils that are consumed, that all of them were promoting blood clot formation. Well, they also found that there are similar increases in triglycerides and clotting factors, um, the clotting factor number seven, after eating all these different oils. The, the authors concluded saying these findings indicate that high fat meals may be prothrombotic, which means causing a blood clot that leads to a heart attack, irrespective of their fatty acid composition. Well, we got to beat up a little bit more on the Mediterranean diet. This was from the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, and they looked at the benefits of the Mediterranean diet, and even with its um, high intake of olive oil. And what they had to say was that heart benefits of a Mediterranean diet are due to it being a nearly vegetarian diet. The Mediterranean diet is a good diet in spite of the olive oil. So what they're saying is it's not the olive oil because we hear the voice, oh, the Mediterranean diet is great. They have less heart disease. And we think, eat more olive oil, eat more olive oil. That's what's been advertised. But that is not why they're healthier. It's because they are consuming more vegetables than we consume in other parts of the world. Particularly, I know for sure in the United States, we have a very low intake of vegetables and fruits. Well, what about free fats and cancer? With cancer being almost number one, but definitely number two in mortality, I think we need to look and see what some of the causes are. So as they have studied it, they have found that the essential fatty acids of both omega-3 and omega-6 inhibit our immune system. It inhibits these specific um, types of cells in our immune system, our natural killer cells. If you get rid of their natural killer cells, those are the ones that attack cancer cells. So that's going to be a problem. Immune substances known as cytokines, interleukin-1, interleukin-2. Both of those are decreased. And then we have tumor necrosis factor, alpha, and also interferon gamma production. These um, help limit tumor destruction. So if you're lowering the function of those, you're going to be increasing your risk for cancer. 
They found that there's a decreased defense against viruses, bacteria, parasites, and cancer cells. I hate to tell you this bad news about what you love, but I think you'd want to hear it because I think all of us know someone, and maybe even in our inner circle, have had someone that has um, maybe even passed away, but has suffered greatly from these different diseases. And I think it's critical that as we are facing increased disease rates in our world, that we need to find out why. So I have a burden to share this with you, and I pray that you really think about it and, and, and even ask the Lord if there should be some changes in your life. Well, let's just look a little bit more at one more research on cancer. They found that both animal and vegetable oils, fats, have been shown to increase the risk of animals developing and dying from cancer. So that's just another study in the, in the correlation between free fats and cancer. Well, there's another problem with our fats, and that comes from when we heat oil up. Now, this study was done with a group of Chinese um, individuals, and what they looked at was unrefined Chinese canola. They looked at refined U.S. canola, the Chinese soybean, and the Chinese peanut um, oils, and then different linoleic and linoleic and eucrusic fat acids heated in a wok to boiling. So they took all these different types of fat, they put them in a wok because they're, the Oriental people are very famous for their wok cooking. Here's what they found, that when they heated these different fats in the wok, that there were cancer-producing byproducts. And if you look on our list, you've got the 1,3-butadiene, benzene, acrolein, formaldehyde, and other similar compounds. All these are highly cancer-promoting, or carcinogenic, as we would say. They found that in the Chinese women, lung cancer is the highest worldwide, but it is not from tobacco smoking. There's a small percentage that is related to tobacco, but the top cause was from indoor air pollution from cooking in a wok. This was in the Journal of National Cancer Institute. Well, here's something that you might not have thought about. Do you realize that free oils are connected to cataracts? It's almost a sure thing. People, as they age, it, you might as well get ready to have your cataracts removed because it happens so frequently. It's almost like one of those things that happen because you're old. Well, there's a cause to it. And having free oils in your diet is one of the main causes. And by the time you start getting older, these oxidative breaking down degeneration of the tissue in the, in the eyes finally get to the point where you need to go have that cornea replaced. They found that both omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids are associated with an increased risk of opac opacification of the lens of the eye, which results in cataracts. If you already have your cataract, if you've already been developing cataracts and you haven't had surgery, perhaps by changing different things in your diet, you could prevent them from progressing. But mostly I want to talk to the younger people because you can change your diet now and prevent the cataracts from happening. So this is an important issue to look at as well. Well, we had mentioned that in the 2000s, the experts started talking to us about coconut oil. They say that Coconut oil improves your thyroid function. It destroys viruses like herpes, hepatitis, cytomegalia virus, a number of viruses. It says that it destroys parasites and giardia. The claims are as wide as the internet is wide. 
One of the biggest claims, some of the promotions that I've seen in the recent years, is that coconut oil reverses Alzheimer's disease. Have you heard that research? Or it wasn't really a research. What it was was a woman whose husband had Alzheimer's and she put him on a high coconut fat diet and his dementia from Alzheimer's went away. And that has gone viral over the internet and people are buying their coconut oil because no one wants to lose their memory. Well, let's look at the reality of coconut oil. In a study on animals, this was done on hamsters, they compared um, the hamsters that were fed hydrogenated coconut oil with or without added cholesterol in their diet. What they found is that the hamsters quickly developed lipid-rich lesions in their arteries that progressed rapidly as they continued the diet to atherosclerotic disease. In another study, that was, it was very similar, but this study was done on rats, and they fed a certain group virgin coconut oil compared to highly processed coconut oil. Now, the virgin oil just hasn't gone through as much process, and there's cold-pressed virgin oil. That's really, if you, if you use any oil at all, whether it's olive oil or coconut oil, the least processed and the best is when it's cold-pressed, because as soon as you add heat to it, it goes up to over 400 degrees when they are using a heat process that damages the bonds and gives us a whole nother problem. So what they're looking at is this less refined coconut oil and the more highly processed oil. What they found was that the most adverse effects on the cholesterol level, this is what they were looking at, it was more in the refined coconut oil than in the virgin coconut oil. So what this is telling us, the conclusion from this, is that the more food is altered, the greater the adverse effects. So I'm not encouraging you to use the virgin coconut oil compared to the refined. I think that the best source of our fats are in the whole food. So the best source for coconut oil will be in the whole coconut. So coconut meat is going to be your best source. So while we're talking about coconut, let's just think about even any of our sources of fats in the plant food. Did you ever realize that all of our nuts, the majority of our nuts, I can't say all of them, chestnuts are, not, are a little bit different, but most of our nuts come in a hard shell do you realize how hard it is to crack into a coconut? You have to, there's a layer like this, you have to get a machete and get all that first outer shell off. And then the hard brown shell that we see when we buy a whole coconut, you've got to take a hammer and you've got to crack it. And it takes a lot of work to, pat, to um, pull that meat out of the coconut. So it takes time. And the reason for that is because we cannot handle so much fat, even when it's in the whole food form. So the Lord put it in a hard shell, like almonds, walnuts, all of these, these nuts that are very difficult to um, get into. If you sit down and you have maybe six or 10 walnuts, it's going to take you a good maybe 15, 30, 20 minutes to crack them open and dig the meat out. But with our processing, our manufacturing um, process today, we can just go down to the store and we can buy a big bag of nuts and they've already been processed for it. And you can sit there and eat handfuls of nuts or seeds. That's not the best way. Even in the whole form, we want to limit these fats because they are very concentrated. Let's look at how concentrated they are. Oils are more concentrated, but fats in general, even in the, the whole form, are very high in, in calories, energy production. They're just a compact form. I have a graph up here, or a chart. 
fat has one gram, one gram of fat has nine calories compared to both protein and carbohydrates with one calorie you only have, excuse me, with only one gram you have four calories. So fat has more than twice the amount of calories per gram. If you take one teaspoon of fat, whether it be olive oil or peanut butter, almond butter is a little bit less. It's, it's not quite as concentrated. But let's just talk in general, a tablespoon of margarine or butter or oil of any kind, it has five grams of fat. If you multiply that by nine, you come up with 45 calories per, um, one, per one teaspoon. Compared to that of sugar or protein, where you have, only, you have four grams per teaspoon, which would give you only 16 calories per teaspoon. So you can see how we can pack the fat on quickly when we're intaking um, these free oils. Now, why is oil so concentrated? Well, let me give you a few statistics. If you have one tablespoon of corn oil, it takes 13 to 15 cobs of corn to make that one tablespoon of oil. Now, even if you're a big eater, it would be really hard to sit down at one meal and eat 13 to 15 cobs of corn. But if you sit down to a meal and you have a tablespoon of oil and you put it on your bread or you put it on your salad, a tablespoon is very little really for the overall meal. I think um, we consume far more than one tablespoon. But you are getting the equivalent of fat that you would have if you ate 13 to 15 cobs of corn. Now, where's the problem with that? Well, it's in the digestion. There's several problems, but just, just, we'll just think about how fat is broken down. What breaks down fat in the body is the bile. It's like if, um, if you put some olive oil on a plate, and you take it over to the sink and you wash that plate off, it doesn't wash off with just water, does it? You need soap to scrub that off and break down the fat. Well, the soap in our body that breaks down and metabolizes fat comes from the liver, stored in the gallbladder, called bile. And when you eat anything that's fatty, whether it's a free fat, the oils, or even in the whole form, like an avocado. What happens is the, the brain sends a message to the gallbladder that fat is coming, and that gallbladder dumps the bile into the upper part of the small intestines, getting ready to break down that fat. We were never meant to consume 15 cobs of corn at a meal your body cannot produce enough bile to break it down sufficiently. So what the body has to do to keep up with that large amount of fat is that it sends a message to the liver to make more cholesterol, to make more bile to handle the fat. And I said cholesterol because it packages that fat as cholesterol. And then if it's more than your body can use, which it is, I will guarantee you that's more than your body needs, then it has to be stored. And it is stored on your hips. It's stored on your waist. It's stored on your legs. It, you, it's stored anywhere in your body. In fact, a very interesting thing is, is that a, a surgeon could go in and do a biopsy anywhere on your body and they will tell you exactly the kind of fat that you're consuming because the fat goes right to a specific place and it's the same kind as what you're, you're eating. Well, the same principle with corn is there with any other food substance. But I threw in here almond butter 
because almond butter isn't really refined in the sense of the oils extracted out. Now, you can get almond oil, but if you take almonds and you process them into a creamy nut butter, look at how concentrated it is. It takes 17 almonds on the average. It could be 14 to 17, depending on the size and the, and the type of almond that you have. 17 almonds for one tablespoon. That's a lot of almonds. And we, we really need like one or two tablespoons on a piece of bread to make it worthwhile. Now let's look at the olives. It takes 44 to 47 olives to make one tablespoon of oil. You would have to sit down and eat one can of olives, medium-sized olives, to um, match that one tablespoon of oil. That's quite a bit, isn't it? So I want you to think about that next time you have oil from your salad dressing or your spreads on your bread or your popcorn or all the numerous places that we take in oil. Well, let's just come to this conclusion that whole foods have the best fats. You can get all of the required essential fatty acids that you need when you get them as close to nature as possible in your starches, your vegetables, your fruits, your seeds, and your nuts. In fact, when you get it in the whole food form, it's water soluble, so it does not disrupt digestion. It, is, it improves your digestion. When it's in the oil form, it is insoluble, and it inhibits your protein digestion particularly. Now, the other good thing about when it's in the whole food form is that there's synergism between the other nutrients that is in the plants, the vitamins, the minerals, the enzymes, the fibers, the antioxidant, all of the nutrients that are packed into that. They all work together and give you an overall better benefit. There's less oxidation and there's less concentration when you get it in the whole food. Let's talk about two really good sources for your omega-3 fatty acids, and that's in whole flax seeds and in chia seeds. These are very, very rich in the omega-3 fatty acids. And you know, I didn't mention one of the benefits for these, why, why they're highly promoted, is that the brain needs these for keeping our, our moods up. So if you have issues with depression, one of the foods or several of the foods that you want will be flaxseed or chia seeds. Now chia seeds has come into popularity in the last decade and it is said of chia seeds that it's a survival food. You could live on the nutrients that are in chia. Some of the benefits of chia and flax is that it lowers cholesterol by 9% and LDL, or bad cholesterol, by 18%. It decreases blood sugar and blood pressure. The ligands, lignans present in flax seeds seem to have an anti-tumor effect when fed in the early stages um, of cancer promotion. One of the best ways to get your chia is to make a chia gel, and I have up here on the screen a recipe what you want to do is mix your chia with some water, shake it up for about a minute, and let it set for 12 to 24 hours. What that does is start the sprouting process, and it actually gives you a threefold increase in all of the phytonutrients in chia gel. Well, there's many more things that we could discuss, but that's an overall view with the biggest picture is that you want to get all the nutrients that your body needs in the best form, and that's in the whole form from the plant world. Hippocrates said, let your food be your medicine and your medicine be your food. Every physician has to take a Hippocratic oath. And so my oath is that I want to learn how to have food to be the best medicine. And any medicine that I recommend for my patients I want it to come from food because that's the best medicine. God bless you, and I hope you've been benefited by our talk today. Until next time, be blessed.